There's a story of a very powerful politician who was getting his portraits done. A photographer came in and was taking some portraits of him. He wanted to have his face up in his office, wanted to make sure everyone could see him in all of his glory. A couple days later, the photographer returned, and he showed him some of the proofs. And as this gentleman went through the proofs, he got angrier and angrier. And finally, he looked up at the photographer, and he said, these photographs do no justice to me. And the photographer looked at him very dryly, and he said, sir, with a face like yours, you don't need justice, you need mercy. I think it's very true that probably all of us could use a little mercy from time to time. You know, there was a, a time in my life where I think mercy broke through to me like it maybe never has before. In 2001, many of you know, my, my wife Sherry passed away in a car accident that we had on the Coquihalla Highway. And I was rushed to the hospital in Merritt and they weren't sure if I had any injuries, but after checking me out thoroughly, they realized that there was really no injuries, just some cuts and some scrapes. Friends, I I've never felt that low in my whole life. My, my whole world had really fallen apart in a nanosecond. I, I felt absolutely crushed that my lovely wife had passed away, and here I was, all I had were a few scrapes. Uh, I've never wanted to die that badly in my life. I've, I've never wanted just to, just to be done with life. I was feeling crushed in my spirit. And I found out that the family had not been notified, and so that was going to be up to me. So I went to the telephone, and I called up Sherry's parents. Her mom answered after the first or second ring. I said, Betty, there's been an accident. Sherry is dead. I don't think you can ever prepare for a conversation like that. I didn't know what her response was going to be, but I'll tell you one thing. I didn't think her response was going to be what it was. Without skipping a beat, without even so much as a breath, she called out, Mikey, are you okay? Mikey, are you okay? It's the greatest mercy I've ever been extended by any human being ever in my life. Her world had just come down in that moment, and yet she was worried about me. And I want to tell you today, friends, the reason that I'm able to be here standing, I believe is due in large part to that great mercy that was shown to me on that day when Betty said to me, Mikey, are you okay? It's what allowed me to really find my footing, what allowed me to stand here in this place, to get back on my feet again. You see, mercy is asking, are you okay, to those who have hurt you, to those who have caused you pain. Friends, mercy is when someone reaches out to us in our greatest failure. I want to ask you this morning, I want you to think about your lowest moment. I want to think about that time when, when you felt lower than a snake's belly, when you just really felt like you had dropped the ball, you were so filled with guilt and shame and all sorts of pain. Did someone reach out to you with mercy? Or did you get mercenaries instead? I think many times when we're at our very lowest, when we need mercy the very most, that's often when the mercenaries come out after us. And they accuse us and they point fingers and they say, how dare you? How could you do that? How could you have fallen to such a degree? And for some of you, you have a hard time. You've come in here to North Point and, and you feel ashamed because of maybe what has happened in the last week. Words that have been said, things that have been done, even thoughts that have been thought. And what you have in your mind is that there's going to be a bunch of mercenaries here ready to gun you down. How many of you have ever had the mercenaries come after you in your lowest moment? Yeah, I, I, probably all of us. Sometimes uh, friendly fire is the, is the worst, right? Family friends, family members, those that are closest to us, a spouse. And it's like... <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard when you need mercy and you get the mercenaries instead. There's a story at the end of Jesus' life. He's getting ready for his death. No one else knows that he's going to die. He's, he's told his disciples, he's given them hints, but no one really gets it. 
And Jesus says some words to them that I think were very startling. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 and 32, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. We see just over in the book of Luke in chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, Jesus has a personal conversation with Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded for you in prayer. I have pleaded for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. I just want to give you some insight on this scripture. First of all, one of the things that really stands out to me is that nothing catches Jesus by surprise. Absolutely nothing catches Jesus by surprise. He understands what is going to happen. He knows that Peter's going to deny him three times. He knows that the other disciples are going to scatter. He knows what's going to happen in the future. Friends, I got to tell you right now, if you are experiencing guilt and shame, if you feel like you have fallen, if you feel really low as you come into this place, and you've got that sick stomach, and you just think, is it ever going to be okay? I want to tell you right now, Jesus knows exactly what you were going to do before you did it. And he still loves you. You see, if he loved you a month ago, and then you fell three weeks ago, he still loves you. Things don't change because he knew what was going to happen. And friends, I got to tell you, when he has this conversation with the disciples, he knows the disciples are going to scatter. He knows that they're going to turn their backs on him, and yet he still pursues them. He still loves them, even really in their moment of greatest shame that's coming up in just a few moments. That's good news. That's really good news for us. The second thing that really stands out to me is that Jesus is praying for us. He tells Peter, he says, Peter, I have pleaded for you in prayer. Friends, I just got to tell you right now, I mean, some of you, you have grandparents or you've got parents that you know are real prayer warriors and they have prayed for you. And, and part of the reason that you're here, part of the reason that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ is because you have a praying friend or a praying family member that has pleaded for you in prayer. But friends, I got to tell you something right now. I don't care how strong that prayer warrior is. No one is a prayer warrior like Jesus Christ himself. And he is praying for you. Friends, right now, if you feel low, if you feel like you've dropped the ball, if you feel like you are not worthy of being here, I want to tell you, Jesus' prayers are going for you and you and you and you and you right now. He's praying for you. He is praying for you. He's in your corner and he's looking for that comeback. Yeah, I know you've fallen, but I'm praying for your comeback. Jesus is praying for your comeback right now. I want you to know that. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome to know that someone is in our corner. Nothing feels so good as having someone in our corner. When you go to someone and you know that thick or thin, that they're going to be there. And I want to tell you right now, Jesus is there for you. So this is what I want to tell you today. For some of you, you basically, you almost slid in here. You feel so low. Don't stay down. Don't stay down on the mat. Don't stay down for the 10 count. You don't have to. Don't stay down in your guilt and your shame and your, your feelings of inadequacy. I want to tell you right now, Jesus loves you. Jesus is pleading for you and he's praying for you. Get up off the mat. There's so much more for you in store. There's so much more. There's so much more. There's so much more. You see, your story has not been written yet. It's barely started. I don't care how old you are. The story is not completed. Jesus is still pleading for you in prayer. Jesus is still looking for that comeback for you. And finally, Jesus has already prepared a restoration plan for you. You see, you might have thought that you've gone too far. You might have thought that you have broken things too far. You might think that your marriage is too far gone or that relationship is too far gone or, or you have fallen from too far a height. And I want to tell you right now, with all the faith that I can muster and with the experience of me breaking things left, right, and center in my own life, that Jesus is in the restoration business. You see, he takes old things and he makes them new. That's so good. He takes old things that are broken and busted and he makes them new. He makes them new. And that's why Jesus says to Peter, he says, listen, when all of this is done, when you have repented and when you've come to your senses, 
go, go and strengthen your brothers. Go and strengthen your brothers. Listen, I'm going to redeem you. I want to use you even in your brokenness. You go and strengthen your brothers. You see, Jesus, he predicts that all of the disciples will betray him. All of them will betray him. But he says, I'm going to meet you afterwards. This is amazing to me, is that Jesus is saying to them, I am going to come to you. And not only am I going to come to you, I'm going to go before you. Most of us, when we make mistakes, or, or when someone has hurt us really bad, what's our natural tendency? We stay away from them, don't we? We pull away. Some of you right now, you're, you're actively pulling away from other people who really love you and really care for you because you have done something really silly. You've really dropped the ball, and what you're doing is you're pulling away. And some of you, someone has done something really really nasty and really mean to you. They've said something or done something. And what you've done is whether, you, whether you've tried to do this on purpose or not, you have pulled away from them. But you know what's crazy about Jesus? In those moments, he does not pull away from you. He goes ahead of you. Not only is he with you, he is going ahead of you and he is preparing the way. He does not slink away from us. He pursues us. He wants to be close. He wants to be close. You see, Jesus knows what you did last summer. <laughs> Jesus knows what you did last week. You guys, Jesus knows what you did last night. He actually knows what some of you did on the way in here today trying to get a parking spot. He knows. <laughs> and yet he still loves you. He still loves you. Peter and the dis disciples, they just said, Jesus, there's no way. We're not going to deny you. <laughs> like, uh, nice little story you're telling here, but we're not going to deny you. But, but Jesus knows that they're going to. In fact, friends, I just want to tell you, sometimes our greatest strength because it becomes our greatest weakness. You see, for Peter, he was the kind of person, he was very loyal. He was a loyal guy. If you look throughout the Gospels, you realize, man, Peter was just like, I'll do anything for you. And he was just loyal. He was, he was the kind of guy, he was, he's always like, I'll fight for you, right? Like, he gets in a scrap for, for everyone else, right? He's that friend. And yet, that loyalty actually turns into disloyalty, doesn't it? He denies Jesus three times. That, that strength, it, it actually becomes a weakness. And I just, I want to say to you, friends, before a fall, often we, we fall in the areas where we think that we're the strongest. Later on, we see how Jesus is being questioned before the council, and it tells us in the Bible that, that Peter followed from a distance. Friends, when we distance ourselves from Jesus, when we pull away from Jesus, we are, we are this close from a fall. Some of you have been distancing yourself from Jesus, and I want to say come close to Jesus because you're this close from a fall. Th that's how we, we fall. That's how we get in trouble. I wonder how sickening it must have been when the rooster crowed. I wonder the pit in Peter's stomach as that rooster crowed, and immediately he's taken back to that conversation with Jesus, where Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And it makes me wonder, throughout the rest of Peter's life, I wonder every time he heard a rooster, if there wasn't part of him within him, each and every day where there's just this, this small little reminder of that worst day of his life, just that small little reminder of that worst day, the time when he fell at his greatest. But friends, I got to tell you this, that even though Peter fell, he did some really good things when he was down. You see, when he was down, he made some good decisions. And friends, if you're, if you're here and you are down, I want to tell you, you can make some great decisions today. The first decision that Peter made was he was sorrowful. We're told in Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, and he went away weeping bitterly. You see, he was sorrowful for what he had done. You see, he didn't minimize what he had done. Many times that's what we do, do don't we? It's like when we've done something, we just kind of minimize it. Well, it wasn't really that big, you know, kind of thing. It wasn't, wasn't really that big of a mistake. And we just try to minimize the problem. Or for some of us, we, we shift blame. We go, well, actually, it wasn't totally my fault. You know, there was that other person. If that silly little girl didn't keep on badgering me, I wouldn't have denied Jesus three times. You know, she just couldn't shut her yapper. I don't know what the big deal is. You know, and we try to blame other people. But, but Peter doesn't do anything like that. 
He doesn't hide his guilt and he hide his shame. Instead, he just owns it. He weeps bitterly. He weeps bitterly and, and, and he really goes to the Lord and asks for forgiveness. The second thing that he did is he found his friends. It tells us in the Gospels that that when Jesus appeared to the disciples, that, that Peter was there, and they, they, were, they were all together. They were, they were kind of hiding. They were hiding for their lives, but they were all together. Friends, I want to tell you right now, the worst place to be when you are going through shame, when you're going through guilt, when you are feeling low, is to be by yourself. I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy, he hates you, and what he does is he wants to divide you, and then that's how he can conquer you. When he can get you off on your own, he'll sow all sorts of lies into your mind. And that's why you need some peeps. That's why you need a team around you that can say, that is a lie. That is not true. God has a design for your life. Yes, you have fallen, but there are greater days ahead. You see, you need a group. That's why we do stuff like Same Page Initiative. That's why we have small groups. That's why we even gather together on Sundays. Because I'm telling you right now, if you want to be a growing Christian, if you want to be a thriving Christian, if you want to be a Christian that can actually get up off the mat after you have fallen. It's going to require some other people who are going to lend a hand, a couple other people that are going to say, we're going to help you through this. So don't be a loner. When you are a loner, you are open for attack, but when you're together, oh, there's some strength there. There's some strength there. Oh, friends, through the years, I have gathered such strength from my peeps. I've gathered such strength from my group of people who can say, Mike, your story's not written yet. Mike, keep on going, keep on going. And then he appealed to God's mercy. We know this because later on in the Bible, we see that, that Peter wrote a few books. And he says this in 1 Peter 1.3, because of his great mercy, God has given us new life by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. This fills us with a living hope. So here's this man who was hopeless after he denied Jesus. Now we read later on, we read the rest of the story, and he is saying, man, Jesus, he fills me with living hope. He fills me with living hope. Why? Because of his great mercy. Man, I've got hope because of his great mercy. And then he goes on to say in 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Friends, Peter was carrying all sorts of weight. And he says, the way that we should deal with this is by giving it to God, not holding it on to ourselves. Friends, there are so many things that we hold on to over and over and over. Some of you, you've walked in today and it's like you are dragging a boulder with you. You can hardly carry the, the guilt and the shame that you feel. And today I want to tell you, when the Bible says cast your care, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean cast like you would with a, a rod and a reel. Because how many of you know when you, when you are carrying something, you, it, it's too heavy for you to even throw? It, it's too heavy. That word cast actually means this, just drop it. Wherever it is, just drop, just let it go. And I'm going to tell you right now, some of you, it's just like you've got a boulder. You've come in with all of this guilt and all of this shame and all of this pain. And I just want to tell you today, you can drop it. You just let it go. And maybe some of you, you think, well, you know, I don't have like a big boulder here. I've just got like this little five pound weight. You carry five pounds around all day. See how you feel at the end of the day. You carry five pounds above your head and see if you can do that for an hour. Even a strong man like Sean Morton couldn't do that. <laughs> it, starts to, it starts to get heavy. Friends, whether you think it's light or whether it's overwhelming, the bottom line is this, you cast it, you let it go. What do you have to cast before the Lord today? What is it that you're carrying today? What is that pain or that shame that you're carrying today? What is that sin or what is that hurt? What is it that's, that's absolutely got you down today? Friends, today I want you to be able to let it go. I want you to be able to, even in your minds right now, that you would just think about whatever it is you're holding and you would just, right now, you just release that. You'd cast your care on him. He cares for you. Here's Jesus' response to Peter. We know this from John chapter 22. Jesus reaches out to him. He reaches out to him. You see, the disciples and Peter, they fell away from Jesus, but he reaches out to them. And it's so beautiful how he does this. He cooks them breakfast. 
You see, for most of us, friends, we don't, we don't cook a meal for someone we don't care about. Spouses, some of you, husbands, I'll just talk about it to the husbands. Husbands, like, come on. Like, just make a meal for your wife, all right? You know what I mean? Breakfast in bed or a supper or something like that. It's amazing what that will do just to, just to bond you together. It's amazing how, how you're just showing, hey, you're valuable to me. And that's what Jesus does. Here are these disciples that have just scattered and they have fled for the hills. And what does Jesus do? He makes them a meal. He makes them some pancakes and some eggs and some sausages. It's not in the Bible, but I know that that's, that's what I would have done. <laughs> He's close to him. It's his way of saying, hey, I love you. It's his way of saying, hey, I'm still with you. I'm with you. And then, then Jesus restores Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times, and three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah. And Jesus says, then I want you to do my work. I want you to feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. He's saying, Peter, I'm not done with you yet. I don't want you to go back to fishing. I don't want you to go back to your old life. I'm not done with you yet. You may have fallen. This isn't the end of the story. I got more in store for you. I've got so much more in store for you. Because Jesus wasn't done with Peter. He didn't discard him on the trash heap. He wasn't yesterday's news. Instead, it was Peter that Jesus chose as the leader of the early church. He says, yeah, you've made some big mistakes, but I'm going to redeem these mistakes. I'm going to redeem your biggest faults and your biggest failures, and I'm going to make something beautiful out of them. You see, Peter's denial did not define him. For some of you, friends, your worst day, that's what's been defining you. And you think, I'm no good. How could anyone love me? I, I, I'm, I'm no good for anything because you are being defined by your worst state. You're being defined by your denial. You're being defined by your sin. You're being defined by some of those words that you spoke or things that you did or things that you didn't do. And you've been carrying that guilt around for so very long. You've been carrying that boulder around for so very long. And I want to say that that does not define you. That that rock that you're holding, it does not define you. That's why the Lord, he wants you to let it go. He wants you to cast it on himself because the denial does not define you. Jesus defines you. What he says about you, that's what defines you. And he says, you're loved. He says, hey, I've still got a plan for you. You are not on the trash heap. So friends, you're not defined by your worst day. You're defined by Jesus' great, great love. You're defined by his great and awesome mercy. Today, today I believe that Jesus is speaking to you. And I believe that he is saying to you, each and every one of you, are you okay? Samantha, are you okay? Charles, are you okay? Mikey, are you okay? You see, he takes us on our worst day and he comes in with his tremendous love, his tremendous mercy. And he says, you're okay. You're okay. Because I'm with you and I'm not done with you. My mercy can reach you even where you're at. Friends, isn't that good news today? Amen. May the Lord bless you.